Okay, so I hope everyone can see my screen. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for your continued interest in these, uh, in these sessions. Hope you're finding them useful. Uh, as we changed uh, this week, we changed the timing just as a trial to see if we can uh, accommodate this timing better for, uh, for more people. So we'll see how this works out. Uh, if it doesn't work out, we'll change the time back to the slot that we have. Right, so today, getting into today's session, uh, we are in module two in the WLAN physical layer module. We're talking about the physical layer, uh, various topics relating to the WLAN physical layer. And uh, as as the uh, the moderator was saying, uh, today's session is about uh, throughput, five data rates, MCS table, and the various things that contribute to uh, these numbers that we see, right? And, and what do these numbers actually mean? What is the actual throughput we can expect? We'll talk about those things. Before we get into that, let's quickly recap the last session that we had last week. Uh, in the last session, we talked about the basics about modulation coding, and that's what is the base for the topic today. So if you if you if you are not if you did not attend the last session, you're new to know Wi-Fi. Today's session might be a little bit confusing, but you can always go back and watch the previous session recording, and then come back and watch this recording, and then it'll probably make uh, more sense. So what we did in the last session was we talked about the various modulation and coding schemes that are used in Wi-Fi. We said that uh, phase shift keying is and QAM are the two uh, modulation rate um, scheme methods that are primarily used in Wi-Fi because they are more efficient methods. We talked about uh, 16 QAM, 64 QAM, 256 QAM, 1024, 4096 QAM, and so on. And we also discussed uh, what is the trade-off right, between throughput and reliability as we increase these modulation rates and we go to higher and higher order modulation rates, what are we going to miss? Uh, of course, we're going to get better throughput, but we're going to trade off on reliability and uh, of the connection. So we talked about how the throughput to reliability trade off works and how that results in the transmitter using different, different modulation rates at in different settings. So for example, if the RF conditions are ideal and if the transmitter is, uh, uh, transmitter is very close to the receiver, then uh, the signal quality is very good then of course the transmitter can use the highest modulation rate and enjoy really high throughput but if the signal conditions between the transmitter and receiver are not very good because of various reasons then you have to drop your uh, modulation rate uh, and to in improve the reliability and that is we re refer to that as rate scaling as we talked about in the uh, in the last session we also in, uh, talked about various terms that we normally use that, that are physical layer related terms like TX power and their units. So TX power is the maximum amount of power uh, that is being the, that is being transmitted by this transmitter. And that is normally measured in watts, milliwatts or DBM or D, uh, So we talked about the conversion between watts and milliwatts and DBM and so on. We also talked about uh, the units and the, the term that is used for the signal that's received on the receiver. It's normally referred to as RSSI or received signal strength indicator. And that is normally the, the, the power, the receive power at the receiver when the receiver is receiving the signals from the transmitter. And that is also measured in DB, DBM. And we said that uh, normally for a wireless LAN receiver, if you're getting it around minus 20, minus 30 DBM, uh, receive signal strength, that's considered to be a very good signal. And then as you go down, go all the way up to minus 80, minus 90 DBM, then that is very poor signal where you may actually drop uh, connectivity. So for most of you who are who have some form of a wireless LAN tool that is scanning on your phone, when you scan a list of all the wireless networks, if you're using some form of a scan utility, then that will tell you what is the signal strength you're seeing and if your signal is good or poor. So we talked about EVM or error vector magnitude, and that is a measure of the, the fidelity or the quality of the, of the, of the signal at the receiver. Uh, we explained what EVM is and how it's measured. We talked about a very important metric called SNR or signal to noise ratio, where we are, it is measuring the quality of the signal, the desired information that's being transmitted with respect to the noise floor. So the simple example we talked about is when I'm talking on this call, the information that is coming out of my mouth, the sound waves that are coming out of my mouth are the information that you want to listen to. So that is can, can be considered as a signal, but there is all other noises around me here. The air condition is turned on, the fan is turned on, my laptop is making some noise and these are all uh, relating to the noise that's in this room that is contributing to the noise level so as long as my signal 
is much better than my noise. I have a very good signal to noise ratio and I can maintain a good communication. So we talked about that. Uh, we talked about coding, source coding and channel coding. What is source coding? What is channel coding? How we, what is coding used for? Uh, coding is used for adding redundancy to the on the transmit side to actually do uh, uh, better better uh, estimation of any errors on the link. So we talked about what various coding methods and what kind of redundancy to add. Talked about OFDM in a little bit more detail. Introduced the concept of multipath. Multipath is basically where uh, a transmitter is transmitting signals to the receiver and the transmitted signals will be radiated in all directions and then they would go in multiple paths to the receiver. So there might be one direct path between the transmitter and receiver where the signal is getting uh, have a direct link and then maybe another copy of the signal is going and reflecting from a wall and getting to the receiver. So the, the paths between the transmitter and receiver, there are many, many paths for the signal and hence it's called multipath, right? We talked about that. We uh, discussed about uh, MIMO and uh, the concept of multiple input, multiple output. Talked about the concept of spatial stream. So if you look at this access point, it has four uh, uh, basically antennas and this is a four by four MIMO access point. So it has four radio chains. So we introduced the concept of what is a radio chain, what is a spatial stream, and how do you get increased throughput using MIMO, using the spatial multiplexing. We talked about the difference between spatial diversity, spatial multiplexing, and so on. So a bunch of topics were covered in the last session. So if for any reason you missed that session, the recording is up on the website. So you can go back and listen. And uh, if this session is confusing to you, I would recommend to please listen uh, to the video recording of the previous session and then come back and, and listen to this one. Okay, so let's get right into the today's topic. Um, we all see Wi-Fi routers and, uh, and and when you buy a Wi-Fi router from an electronic store, on the box it will say um, faster speed, better throughput, and they'll put some throughput numbers. So if you look at this example, they're saying it can do 1.8 gigabits per second Wi-Fi speed. Now that is speed, that is not throughput. But when you connect your phone, uh, you, you, you buy this lap, uh, router and it says 1.8 gigabits per second, you come, you put it in your house, you install it, and then you connect your phone to that particular Wi-Fi router, you do a, do a quick speed test from your phone and you're getting much, much lesser numbers than 1.8 gigabits per second. So you must be wondering why is it, why am I getting only like 500 kilobits per second or 10 megabits per second or 50 megabits per second, which is much lesser than what was advertised like 1.8 gigabits per second on the Wi-Fi router. There are a number of reasons why that happens. And uh, the device that you're using is also one of the reasons. The environment that you're in is also a reason. There are so many reasons that we'll talk about that in the session. And what does the, the number on the box mean? How did they come up with this number? We'll talk about that. Uh, and then also, what can you actually expect as a result uh, from this unit? We're going to talk about that also in this session. OK, so um, really, to control that speed, that 1.8 gigabit per second speed that you're seeing in the box, how are we getting to the number? Uh, we are really getting to that number by controlling, at a high level, three different variables that we have, right? And that are represented by the three different dimensions in this diagram that you see here, right, at the bottom right-hand corner. So what are the three dimensions? One dimension is wider channels. So remember, when we were talking about 11 ABG, uh, we were talking about 20 megahertz wide channel. In the initial 2.4 gigahertz band, there was only about approximately 80 megahertz of spectrum available. So not much spectrum available for unlicensed use. So what they did was they said, okay, we need multiple channels. We can't use all the 80 megahertz for one channel. We need multiple channels. So they came up with this concept of 11 channels and they divided them into three non-overlapping channels and said, okay, each channel is going to be approximately 22 megahertz or 20 megahertz wide. So that is the channel width that we had to transmit information. So that's great. But as we went, came up, we came up with five gigahertz and then six gigahertz, there was more spectrum available. In a five gigahertz band, there was more than 600, 700, or close to 700 megahertz of spectrum available, which is almost eight, nine times of what was available in the 2.4 gigahertz band. And then when um, six gigahertz spectrum opened up, we had about 1.2 gigahertz of spectrum, just almost twice the five gigahertz spectrum. So as the spectrum started, more and more spectrum started becoming available, the standards body said, okay, let us now have wider channels. So we started with 20 megahertz channels, and then, then, then we went to 40 megahertz channels, and then we went to 80 megahertz channels, and then 160, and then up to 320 in the latest standard. So what are we doing here? 
what we are doing here is we are using more and more spectrum and hence we are doubling uh, quadrupling our data rates we are not if we're not more efficiently using the spectrum we are just using more spectrum that's that's it. that's basically it so if you're able to do x amount of throughput in 20 megahertz you should be able to do 2x in 40 megahertz by bonding those channels and using a wider wider uh, spectrum just like if you have a highway if you're able to trans send 10 cars on a single lane if you have two lanes in 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 theory you should be able to send uh, send 20 cars in the same time because you have twice the amount of uh, road uh, road space available right the same concept so that is one dimension or one variable where you're increasing the bandwidth the other dimension is uh, what we call refer to as the modulation and coding schemes which is what we are going to talk about uh, a lot today we in the previous sessions we talked about the various modulation rates 16 qualm 64 qualm so as we increase the modulation rates and go to higher order modulation rates we are able to pack more information more bits per symbol which means that on the exact same uh, symbol or waveform instead of sending one bit of information now we are able to send two four eight twelve bits of information so, so that's how you're increasing the throughput so you're not increasing the channel bandwidth uh, or the channel width within that same channel width you are able to send more information and by increasing the modulation rates we are able to pack more and more information into the same band now we we, we said okay increasing the modulation rates will increase your throughput but then it will need better signal to noise ratio to maintain that connectivity which means the reliability will be less that's what we covered in the in the last session so that's the second dimension increasing your modulation rates and getting better and better throughput and then there is a third dimension which is the number of spatial streams or what we refer to as spatial diversity if you look at this ap uh, it is basically having four antennas and if this is a four by four mimo ap it will be using four radio chains here and then these four radio chains in theory are expected to get you four times the throughput because now you're able to maintain multiple radio transmissions transmitters and multiple receivers on the receive side and by actually implementing four cross four mimo you should in theory get four times the throughput that you would get from uh, one cross one right now of course that is theory practically there are lots of lots of other things but the technology will support that and by if you go from four cross four to 16 cross 16 or eight cross eight every time you do that you're increasing substantially your throughput so again to summarize the three dimensions or the three things are channel width and then we have modulation multiple modulation rates and then we have number of spatial streams these are the main things and by varying these things and increasing these things, you get better and better and better speeds. That's how we got from 1 Mbps, 2 Mbps in Wi-Fi 1 to now up to almost 50 gigabit per second in Wi-Fi 7 by varying these three things. Right? So if you look at this information here again on this table on the right hand side, uh, Wi-Fi 1, we did like 1 and 2 Mbps and then Wi-Fi 2, which is 11B, uh, added uh, better modulation, uh, better coding rates, CCK rates. And that gave us 5.5 and 11 Mbps. It is still in the 2.4 gigahertz band. And then Wi-Fi 3 came along. The 5 gigahertz spectrum opened up. And, and uh, we started using OFDM modulation rate, which is a, a more efficient modulation method. And that took us from 11 Mbps to 54 Mbps. And then, and then Wi-Fi 4 came along. 11N got introduced. Here, we introduced the concept of MIMO. So then MIMO got us up to 4 cross 4 MIMO. It got us from 54 to 600 Mbps. And then as we came along in AC, we started increasing the number of uh, uh, spatial streams and a number of, uh, we started increasing the channel bandwidth. And then that's how Wi-Fi 5, 6, 6E and 7 started getting more and more and more throughput, right? Uh, and that is basically how, how this, this works at a, at a fundamental level. Now that's what's this summarized in, in here. Uh, some of you or many of you who come from the Wi-Fi background would have heard this term called MCS table and that's what we're going to talk about mostly in this session. Um, MCS again stands for modulation coding schemes uh, and uh, that is a combination of modulation rate and coding rate that you're using to come up with a certain physical layer data rate and the table MCS table lists all these combinations and it will tell you what is the physical layer data rate you can expect for a particular combinations a combination of things. So what are the various things here? Now we talked about modulation rate as one of the variable. Uh, we talked about coding rate as one of the variable. That I did not show in the three dimensions, but this is another one where you can vary to get different rates. We talked about number of spatial streams or MIMO as one of the variable. We talked about channel bandwidth. And there is another variable also we did not talk about before, which is called as the guard interval. Guard interval is nothing but the space between 
two symbols in, in an OFDM communication. We'll talk more about that in the, in the next slide. And that is also a variable, right? So by varying all these things, uh, modulation rates can go from VPSK to all the way up to 4096 form. Coding rates can be one half, three, four, five, six. Uh, and we, we said, okay, one half creates 50% redundancy for every one bit of information uh, that you want to send. You're actually transmitting two bits to actually create some redundancy. And so there's 50% redundancy. When you go to three fourth, the redundancy goes from 50% to, uh, to only 25%, right? So the, the, the more, the, the more, uh, you change in this coding rates the more throughput you will be will be getting same thing with the number of spatial streams you can go from siso all the way up to 16 by 16 mimo channel bandwidth you can go from 20 megahertz all the way up to 320 uh, megahertz channels and then guard interval we can go from short guard interval 800 nanosecond or, or actually 400 nanoseconds 800 1600 200 i forgot to put 400 here but uh, you can have different levels of uh, guard intervals also and by varying these combinations then you will get uh, the different data rates so again to summarize here these are the parameters uh, wider channels uh, mimo different levels of mimo uh, higher order modulation rates and uh, different types of coding rates these are kind of the the various parameters that you use to get the mcs rates now guard interval is the new thing we did not talk about this in the last last session so let me talk a little bit about what is this guard interval a uh, guard interval is nothing but uh, the space between the OFDM, uh, OFDM symbols. Remember, we mentioned that uh, most all the modern Wi-Fi protocols uh, use OFDM as the as the method uh, as the modulation scheme to actually send information. So OFDM is broken down into many subcarriers, and each subcarrier will will uh, will carry some amount of data information. Now these subcarriers, if you look at the time domain. Uh, then you need to, uh, in the frequency domain, you have multiple subcarriers. But if you take one set, one burst of subcarriers, and then that burst of subcarriers is transmitted uh, one after the other, and that's on the time domain. So on the time domain, you'll see that one burst of OF symbols, symbols are sent, and then afterwards there is a gap in time, and then the next burst is sent, right? And that the gap between the bursts is basically called as guard interval. Why do we need guard interval? It's very simple. You take this example that I have here on the right hand side. Uh, there is one car that is being, uh, as you, let's assume that this first car is the first uh, burst of OFDM symbols, and this one is the next one. Now, if both of them are starting at the same time, then we remember we talked about this concept of multipath. So, multipath means that the transmitter uh, is sending information to the receiver, and the transmitter signals could go on multiple paths. So let's assume that this car, which is my first symbol, is actually traveling on this path. And then the second car is actually starting right behind it. And it is actually traveling at the same speed. But because the first path car has to travel longer distance, both of them could potentially get to the receiver at the same time. And there could be collision or what is also referred to as interference or intersymbol interference. Uh, that's basically what you could have at the receiver. You don't want this to happen. Now, if you go back and uh, if you increase the gap, see this gap here in time, this is the gap in time. So let's say this guy is way behind here and he's transmitting. So even if he, he gets delayed a little bit, uh, there will be no collision because this, this, this car will re, uh, arrive at the destination before this car, if there is enough gap between these two. And that gap is called the, the guard interval. The shorter the guard interval, the more probability that you will see this problem, right? Where you'll see interference between the, the symbols, right? Now, again, the longer, but why, but if you have a longer guard interval, that means that we are wasting the space, we are wasting time. So that means your throughput will go down. So again, it's a throughput versus reliability trade off. Shorter the guard interval, you'll have more throughput, but less reliability, and it's more prone to error. So, especially if you're using if you are transmitting in an in a environment that has too much multipath, where uh, the delay spread could be wide, which means that the, the time difference between the, the first uh, uh, copy and the last copy, remember I mentioned, talked about delay spread last time, is way too wide, then you need to use a guard interval that is wider than the delay spread to, uh, to avoid intersymbol interference, right? So again, wider the, the guard interval, uh, the more reliable your communication is, the less error prone it is. But again, that will decrease your throughput. Again, the same throughput to reliability trade-off that we have. So hope that is that is clear.
so that is another another another, another option so now let's go back to the the let's start from the base like abg mcs rates and so on so just to again summarize here the base dot 11 standard was using uh, uh, direct sequence spread spectrum te te technology and uh, it was using basically spreading the 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 bits using uh, uh, what we call as a spreading sequence or a chip chip sequence and uh, we're using very low modulation rates and hence from here we are only getting 1 and 2 mbps data rates when we went to 11b uh, which is wi-fi 2 we said okay they they use better coding schemes they didn't change the the modulation rates they change they use better coding schemes where they were only using a chip length of 8 instead of 11 and uh, because of that you got higher throughput or higher data rates 5.5 and 11 mbps so we went from 1 2 to 5.5 and 11 mbps and then when we came to uh, AG or Wi-Fi 3, uh, this is where, as I mentioned before, OFDM got introduced. And OFDM is a more efficient, uh, spectrally efficient modulation technique. And uh, and also we ordered, we introduced even more higher order modulation techniques. It was only BPSK and QPSK before. Now we have 16 QAM and 64 QAM. And because of that uh, OFDM and because of going all the way up to 64 QAM, which would uh, which would have send basically more bits per symbol the data rates went all the way up to 54 uh, mbps right so uh, uh, abg uh, got us to uh, basically ang got us to 54 mbps and then came 11n so 11n if you look at this diagram this is where ang war at 54 mbps right this small this pipe that you see here so then what they said is, okay, we'll improve OFDM even more. So rather than having 48 uh, subcarriers, we'll try to get to 52 subcarriers. And so they improved the efficiency of OFDM and that uh, resulted in increase of uh, data rates from 54 Mbps to 65 Mbps, which is this green pipe here. So now with Wi-Fi uh, 4 or 11N, with, uh, with the just one 20 megahertz channel, uh, we are able to get up to 65 Mbps, five data rates. Now they said, okay, fine, we have 20 megahertz, but now since five, gig, five gigahertz is available, which is wider spectrum, now we can do channel bonding. And we can say 20 megahertz and 20, add two 20 megahertz uh, channels and get to 40 megahertz. So that's what this pipe is, where you add these two green pipes, and now you double 65 Mbps and you get up to 135 Mbps uh, data rates. Right. So this is uh, basically if you're doing 40 megahertz channels and then they said, OK, fine, we'll introduce a short guard interval we, up to this point. They were using this long guard interval, which is about 800 nanoseconds. Uh, and then they introduced this concept of let's use this short guard interval and they went up to 400 nanoseconds. So now this because of that, this 135 became 150. So you got an additional 15 Mbps data rate because for going from. 400 nanoseconds, uh, 800 nanoseconds to 400 nanoseconds guard interval. Remember I said, if you go to smaller guard intervals, you're able to send more information and you're getting better, better throughput. So with one of these things that you see here, which is 40 megahertz channel bandwidth, and it's still one crore of SISO, you can get up to 150 Mbps throughput. Now they said, fine, let, this is all great. We are doing 40 megahertz channels. Let's, let, let's go for even more throughput. And this is where in 11N, the concept of MIMO got introduced. So they introduced this concept of up to four cross four MIMO. So if this one pipe is one uh, one spatial stream, now if you multiply that with four, so if you add two spatial streams, two cross two, this 150 now becomes 300. So that is two spatial streams. Now you double the throughput from 150 to 300 or, or data five data rate to 300 Mbps. If you add a third spatial stream, you add another 150 Mbps. Now you get 450 Mbps, three spatial streams. And if you add another one, you can go up to 600 Mbps, which is four spatial streams. So this was the 11N spec. 11N spec increased the channel bandwidth from 20 megahertz to 40 megahertz, improved the OFDM rates, uh, increase or reduce the guard interval, and also added MIMO, up to four cross four MIMO. By making all these variants, so if you see in this table back here, it changed all of these variants. Right? Uh, you see in this table here, um, it changed the, uh, the, the, the coding rate, the basically changed the number of spatial streams, channel bandwidth, guard interval, it changed all these variables. And that is how you went from 54 Mbps in, uh, in AG 
to up to 600 mbps so it's a big jump from 54 to 600 that is more than 10 times the data rate by varying all these variables they got to that that point so if you want to look at the table for 11n this is how the table look this is where what is called as an mcs table so you can see these uh, 11n this particular column here is the number of spatial streams so if you start with one uh, spatial stream then you use different modulation rates you start from bpsk qpsk 16 palm 64 palm and use various coding rates one half three fourth and uh, different coding rates are used so these are the combinations and uh, on this axis you see the combinations of 20 megahertz 40 megahertz and also for each channel bandwidth you use the long guard interval and short guard interval. these are all the vari variables that we're talking about spatial streams modulation coding channel bandwidth guard interval all five variables are here so if you vary all these five variables then you're getting different amounts of phi data rate right? that's what this table is saying so you start with the combination for one cross one or, or uh, siso and then you go to two cross two and then you go to three cross three and then you go to four cross four and all these things are repeated here you can see that all of these things are repeated so as i was saying before if you're using the highest modulation rate the best coding scheme and you're doing full 40 megahertz channel bandwidth and you're using the shortest guard interval all those combinations you get 150 mbps of phi data rate this is what, what i showed in the previous uh, uh, previous slide you got up to 150 mbps right um, now you can double that with two cross two mimo you go to 300 and double that with three cross three mimo you go to 450 and then double that with uh, again you you increase that with four cross four mimo and now you're getting to 600 so those are the, the that's basically the table now with this table you'll also see this concept of what we call as mcs index which is a very important thing when you're looking at mcs table mcs index is nothing but a number that is allocated uh, for this particular combination of variables so what this is saying is mcs0 refers to one spatial stream bpsk modulation one half coding rate so that combination refers to as mcs0 in this table now with uh, 11n they went from 0 all the way up to 31 right so m0 to 7 will represent mcs uh, uh, number of spatial streams 1 8 to 15 will go to spatial streams 2 and that way you went all the way up to 31 so mcs 31 means that this is 4 cross 4 mimo 64 uh, qualm modulation rate 5 5 6 coding rate this combination is referred to as mcs 31 so with 11n we went from mcs 0 to mcs 31 and that covers all combinations of spatial streams modulation types and coding rates right so this is the the, the mcs table for 11n now let us fast move forward to 11ac 11ac said okay 11n would only was only doing uh, uh, 40 megahertz channels uh, let us do 80 megahertz and 160 megahertz channels and let us support up to eight spatial streams again with, with it was four cross four my mimo now we'll get up to eight cross eight mimo and let us also uh, so by increasing the channel bandwidth and increasing the number of spatial streams and they also uh, introduced newer modulation scores schemes like 1024 qualm so again all the three variables changed and that allowed us to get to up to 6.93 or close to seven gigabits per second uh, remember with 11n we were at maximum of uh 600 mbps right with four cross four that was the maximum uh 11 ac got us up to almost seven gigabits per second by going from four cross four mimo to eight cross eight mimo by going from 40 megahertz channel bandwidth to almost 160 megahertz channel bandwidth by going from uh, uh lower order modulation rate which is 64 qualm to going up to 256 qualm right sorry i said 100,024, but it's actually 256 qualm right so by changing these three variables uh you are able to get to uh this this speeds so wi-fi 5 or 11 ac was the first standard which actually crossed the gigabit boundary for wi-fi and everyone was super excited i remember i was also very excited because this was the first wi-fi technology that was able to get past one gigabit per second rates and that was a big milestone in uh, for wi-fi uh, and so you went up to all the way up to 6.93 gigabit per second then came uh, uh, 11 uh, AX, uh, so actually I skipped the 11AC part here. Uh, then came 11AX. So 11AX uh, 
what it did was it added uh, the 1024 form modulation rate which is even a higher order modulation rate uh, and then uh, we didn't change the channel bandwidth we stayed at uh, 160 megahertz up to 160 megahertz so not much change from a uh, throughput point of view for between 11 ac and 11 ax uh, the standards committee said okay with 11 ac we already have very good throughput we are, we got crossed the gigabit boundaries we are now at almost 6 gigabit per second fire rate that's all great but let us focus on efficiency more than throughput because we are now expecting to have many devices on the network and how do we efficiently manage all these devices so 11 ax was focusing more on uh, efficiency than just on raw throughput so the throughput improvements were minimal we went from 256 form to 1024 form so only the the modulation uh, rate uh, variable was changed the channel bandwidth and the no, the number of uh, spatial streams mimo stayed the same Right, those did variables did not change and because of that we get a little bit higher throughput we went up to 9.6 gigabits per second throughput i i think for uh, for 11 11 ax but 11 ax introduced concepts of ofdma multi-user mimo all these techniques that would make the use of the channel more efficient and not just go for raw throughput but we go for efficiency how is it more efficient what are these techniques we'll learn as we as we go and then came Wi-Fi 7, which is the latest standard, which is yet to be released. And uh, again, they went for speeds. So they said, okay, fine. We went to like almost 10 gigabits per second with uh, with Wi-Fi 6. Let's let's double, quadruple the speeds. So again, along with efficiencies, Wi-Fi 7 went for speeds. So how do you get better speeds with Wi-Fi 7? Again, you change those three variables. You change the modulation uh, rates. You change the channel bandwidth. You change the, the, the number of spatial streams. You play with those three variables again so now what did they do they went from 1024 qualm uh, which is 10 bits per symbol to 4096 qualm uh, which is a much higher uh, higher model modulation rate and that in, in, improves your throughput uh, we went from uh, up to 160 megahertz channels to 320 megahertz channels why 320 because six gigahertz spectrum got opened up remember i mentioned about six gigahertz spectrum which is which has a lot more uh, unlicensed spectrum available and because of that you now can afford to have even wider channels up to 320 megahertz uh, megahertz channels so and then the mimo went from uh, 8 cross 8 in the previous standard to now 16 cross 16 so you can go up to 16 cross 16 so again you change the modulation uh, better much better modulation much, much more channel bandwidth much more number of spatial streams and that took your uh, fire data rates from about 10 gigabits per second all the way up to close to 50 gigabits per second. Right? So this table will show you only for one spatial stream. Uh, so one spatial stream, the maximum possible is around uh, 2.8 uh, gigabits per second. Now multiply that with 16, if you have 16 spatial streams, and that will get you close to about 48 uh, gigabits per second data rates. Right. So that is where Wi-Fi 7 goes uh, close to uh, almost uh, 50 gigabits per second. Now, one of the things that happened along the way is uh, that the way the MCS indexing is done has changed. Uh, if you remember in 11N, I was saying it goes all the way from 0 to 7 and then all the way up to 31. And they decided, okay, now if you're doing up to 4 cross 4, it's fine. But if you're going to 8 cross 8 or 16 cross 16, these numbers will become very big. So instead of doing that, what they did is they said, let us go from uh, MCS zero to a certain number in one spatial stream, and then uh, for the, the next spatial, for two spatial streams, three spatial streams, four spatial streams, we'll repeat the same numbers, right? So the data rate become a combination of spatial streams and MCS rates. So normally, instead of writing just the MCS rate, we'll when we are looking at five data rates, the notation we'll use is NSS which is number of spatial streams plus the MCS rate. So for example, a particular phi data rate could represent by NSS2, which is two spatial streams uh, in combination of MCS11, which is 1024 form. There could be another combination where you have NSS4, four spatial streams, MCS11, which is that combination is four spatial streams and 1024 form modulation. So you, you now write the notation as number of spatial streams plus the MCS index as the as the notation to to get to uh, high data rates right so we talked about 11 ve this is the full mcs table um, for those of you who are interested you can go check it out uh, there is uh, there is also this website called uh, 
uh, mcsindex.com, which some of you might know. So you can go to this website here, mcsindex.com. I put that uh, in the in the reference section, and you can look at all the uh, all the details. It's everything is here. So here you can see uh, for HT, VHT, HE, a number of special streams, different modulation rates, different coding rates, different channel bandwidths. What are the different uh, five data rates? I think this table is not updated for Wi-Fi seven yet. Uh, but hopefully they'll update it at some point for they'll add the 320 megahertz and also the 4096 form modulation rates and so on. Uh, there's also uh, some calculators available online. I posted the links uh, as well for those things. Okay, moving on. Um, there is also a, a way to calculate these five data rates. Again, if you go to this website, they'll tell you details about it. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to explain this in more detail. But uh, uh, there is a way to calculate these five data rates, and it's a com it's a, there's a particular combination of things you can use. You can look at the number of subcarriers, number of coded bits per symbol, and the coding rate, and the number of spatial streams. And then if you divide that by the the one symbol duration uh, for OFDM plus the overhead, which is the guard interval, if you take that in the denominator and you and take all these things in the numerator, that's how you get the data rate, uh, five data rate in Mbps. I'm in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. But uh, I, the references will, will tell you how to do that in more detail. OK, so now let us kind of talk about, that is all great. We're talking about five data rates. And coming back to the same picture here, what is shown on the box is exactly what we talked about so far. That is the five data rate. If you're doing uh, what this particular AP is saying is it can do 4 cross 4 MIMO, 80 megahertz channel bandwidth, uh, 256 form modulation rate, and that combination will give you, uh, or is it 1024? The combination will give you 1.733 gigabits per second uh, five data rate, which is rounded off to 1.8. So that's how this number was put on this box. But in reality, is that what you're going to get? Um, that's not what you're going to get. The five data rate is very different from the throughput you're getting. So what is throughput? Throughput is the actual information that you're able to carry forward. I, throughput could mean IP level, TCP level, transport layer throughput. When you're trying to run an application, when you're trying to run a speed test, uh, what is the number you're getting? What is the throughput you're getting uh, over the over the link? And this is at the higher layers, right? Not the Wi-Fi layers, but the higher layers. So that is what is really important because when you're trying to stream a high definition video, and if the high definition video or, or ultra high definition video or 4K video, whatever you want to call it, needs 20, 30 Mbps throughput, then that is the number you care about. It doesn't matter what five data rates your AP support. If you're not able to get the throughput, then it, it's not very useful. So now we need to see how these five data rates actually translate into throughput, right? That's the, the thing that we're going to look at it now. Right? So one of the things is right off the bat, the, the, uh, if you look at the, the five data rates, even without doing anything, there is you have to account for a certain amount of overhead. So at a physical layer, if you're saying this is 1.8 gigabits per second, even in the most ideal conditions, if you're running IP traffic, if you're running a basic throughput test, uh, you will only get about 60, 70% of that as your throughput. Why? Because there's a lot of overhead, right? So there is physical layer overhead, there is uh, framing, there are headers. We are going to talk about frames, headers, and all of that. Uh, there is interframe space, gap between frames that will take some air time. That will uh, that will take up some uh, some of the airtime and that will create overhead. There are management and control frames in the channel that will take up some airtime. That will take up some that will create some overhead. There is backup algorithms. There is uh, interference. Uh, there are guard intervals. We talked about uh, backward compatibility, legacy mode. We have the concept of acknowledgments. Anytime you send a data packet, the transmitter will send the data packet to the receiver. You have to wait for the receiver to acknowledge it. That takes some time. That wastes some bandwidth. Uh, you are also talking about rate adaptation. You might be, remember, you might be using the highest modulation rate, which is getting you this 1.8 gigabit per second. But if your channel conditions are not good, you have to drop your modulation rate. And that will basically reduce the throughput further. And then if you have smaller packet sizes, if you're sending large amount of information, you'll get full throughput. But if you're sending smaller packet sizes, then the overhead will be even more. So there are several factors. I only listed some of them. But there are many factors that are causing the overhead which will contribute you to slowly take out some portion of that, this 1.8 1, 1 gigabits per second. If you apply each of these overheads, that number will start reducing into a much smaller number. And where we end up is, is something that inter is interesting to, interesting to see. So the point to take away here is the actual throughput you can measure. 
is potentially a lot lower than the advertised five data rates on the access point and there are a number of factors that contribute to that now there is this interesting calculator that we have um, and it's not publicly available but i can share it with anyone who's interested this uh, calculator was created by one of my mentors uh, one of the founders of my previous company I used to work for it's basically uh, what he did here is he he created this uh, uh, a spreadsheet where you can input various uh, of these options and you can actually measure what what can you expect as the the throughput for that particular combination right it's a very interesting calculator so you can see that for example this is 11 ax throughput calculator so for 11 ax you are entering your mcs index as 9 uh, which is your highest uh, uh, M, uh, or is, uh, mcs index that is available uh, and then uh, or maybe it's 11 ac calculator maybe i put the wrong title here i'll fix that uh, but uh, and then you have the channel bandwidth you set the channel bandwidth you set the guard interval uh, and you set the number of spatial streams if you set all four of these combinations it will tell you that this is the possible phi data rate and that is what's on the box remember the 1.8 gigabits per second is this number 1.17133 megabits per second which can be rounded off to 1.8 gigabits per second so this is your physical data rate for this combination mcs9 uh, 4 cross 4 MIMO spatial streams, 80 megahertz channel bandwidth, short guard interval. This is what you can expect at the five data rate. But what does that translate into MAC layer or IP layer throughput? So it translates to around 1.162 gigabits per second. So you lost about close to 600 Mbps just for the overhead and the overhead. And this is ideal conditions, remember. I'm not talking about non ideal conditions. Under ideal conditions, if you're, if you're, you're losing about 20-30% uh, of your uh, uh, throughput uh, just for the overhead in the protocol. And there is a lot of overhead in the protocol, right? And that, that causes your throughput to go down to about 1.1 uh, gigabits per second. Now you can change the settings and see how the throughput is varying uh, when compared to the PI data, right? So we have a calculator here. I'll just quickly show you the calculator. Uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to share it. This is basically the spreadsheet here. You can change that from, uh, for example, you change from MCS9 to MCS5. You can see that the PHY data rate is now goes down to 1040 megabits per second. And uh, if you are uh, uh, if you are using the highest frame size, here 1500 bytes, then uh, you can see that off that 1040, you can only get about 800 Mbps close to the remaining 240 Mbps is overhead. Right now, that is if you are doing the full packet sizes. Let's say you're sending voice traffic and voice traffic normally doesn't send information IP packets at very large frame packet sizes. It sends it at much smaller packet sizes. So now the packet size or the frame size, instead of 1500 bytes, I change it to 256 bytes. So now you can see that that 800 dropped to about 340. So much lesser, lesser throughput. By varying these settings, you can understand what kind of actual throughput you can expect when you vary these settings. So that's what this calculator shows for 11N and 11H. Unfortunately, this has not been updated for 11AX and, uh, and 11BE yet, uh, but there are other calculators also available. So those who are interested, uh, uh, we're going to post this uh, this calculator in, uh, in the WhatsApp group or uh, maybe upload it onto the website. Right, so going back to the, the topic of this, um, so this, I actually put some graphs together from that particular calculator uh, based on the information that, uh, that that calculator has. You can see for various MCS rates, uh, for this is for four cross four 80 megahertz. Uh, this, the first bar is the theoretical phi data rate. You can see the phi data rate. Uh, as I showed here, if you're doing uh, MCS nine, the highest MCS index, your physical data rate is uh, 1.7 gigabits per second. But what you can actually achieve at MAC layer uh, or the IP layer is only about 1.1. So this is the extra overhead. Now, as you do lower MCS rates, you can see uh, what is the what can be achieved under ideal conditions with respect to what is uh, um, the theoretical value or the the phi data rates. Now, why is this important? This is important if you are, for example, if you are especially a test engineer, a Wi-Fi test engineer, and you are benchmarking the performance of your Wi-Fi router, uh, it is very important. This information is very important because you will measure a certain amount of throughput. You don't know if it's good or bad. And you need to understand, uh, can I compare it with the maximum possible theoretical limit? And how far I, I am from the 
the theoretical limit. So to know that information, you can use this calculator. So when you use this calculator, you can see that the maximum possible throughput you can get with this combination is only about 1.1 gigabits per second. So if your AP, when you're running a test on your AP and it is able to get 1.1, that means that your AP is hitting theoretical capacity and it's performing really well. And if it's only getting like 900 Mbps, then it's not performing really well and there could be some issues. So that's how you benchmark the performance. And that's where this, these kind of calculators will be uh, very useful. The bottom chart is uh, of, uh, throughput in comparison with uh, packet sizes. I mentioned smaller packet sizes, the throughput will drop a lot. For the exact same combination, just by changing the packet sizes, your throughput is dropping all the way. If I'm using a 15, 18 byte packet size, I'm getting 1.1 gigabit. Uh, under the exact same conditions, if I use a 64 byte packet size, I'm dropping the throughput all the way up to 146 megabits per second. So it is a big factor of the packet size because packet size, uh, the smaller the packet size, the more the overhead because the headers will remain the same. All the header lengths will be the same. The payload is decreasing. Right? So of course, the overhead will increase a lot. Okay, to summarize this in, in, uh, sim in more simpler terms, uh, there is there are other factors also. If you say, again, you go back to the same example of my 1.8 gigabits per second Wi-Fi router, that supports 4 plus 4 MIMO 80 megahertz channel bandwidth. Uh, but in reality, my laptop that I have may only support 2 cross 2 MIMO 40 megahertz because most laptops are not 4 cross 4. They are probably 2 cross 4, 2. Right? Already, even under ideal conditions, my phi data rate that I can do already dropped from 1733 Mbps to 400 Mbps because 2 cross 2 40 megahertz can only do up to 400 Mbps phi rate. And when my client is talking to my access point, I can only communicate at this speed, right? You have to go for the least common denominator. You cannot say my router is doing 1.7 gigabits per second, so you better do 1.7. There is no way the client can do that because the client can only do this. So what the communication with this, between these two devices, the maximum fire rate rate can only be this. It cannot be more than that. So already, because my client is only two cross two, even though my router is like super fast, high-end router, I'm getting much better, lower performance. And then I add a, a, another variable, which is distance. So let's say I move this laptop 10 meters away from the Wi-Fi router. Now I cannot maintain the, the higher order modulation rate, 1024 form. Maybe I have to drop from MCS 9 to MCS 3, lower, lower data, uh, uh, modulation rate. And that drops my data rate again from 400 Mbps. This is the five data rate from 400 Mbps to 120 Mbps. Already I dropped a lot. And then you apply another variable. Now you re remove all the Mac. Remember, I, I, I was telling you that there is a lot of Mac overhead, Phi overhead, and all of that. And if you remove that overhead, you lose another 20 Mbps. Now you came to 100 Mbps. And then you are, let's say, running small packet sizes, like uh, 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 you're running voice traffic and things like that. Then you drop your throughput even more. So the realistically speaking, your ac actual achievable throughput is, is, is much lesser than what's ever, uh, advertised in the box. And I am talking about only one client here. Now, what if you had 10 clients that are connected to this access point? Now they're all sharing that bandwidth. So this 80 Mbps that we have is now shared between 10 people. So now your theoretically achieved throughput is only about eight or 10 Mbps. So when you apply all these factors, the throughput, actual achievable throughput can be much lesser. So to solve these problems, the newer standards have uh, applied uh, these techniques like OFDMA and multi-user MIMO and other things. So what does, uh, for example, multi-user MIMO do at a very high level. We are saying that this AP has four spatial streams, but let's say this client has only two spatial streams. Right? Now, when this AP is talking to this client, and now they have to talk in only in two cross two because this client will only do two cross two. So now he, he has wasted the, the additional bandwidth of those additional two spatial streams. Now, how do you make use of that? You can say, I'm going to use this technique called multi-user MIMO, which means that this AP has four spatial streams. It will use two spatial streams to talk to this device and it use another two spatial streams to talk to a different device simultaneously, right? So now you're getting better. You're using the medium and the, the things better. Now you're using four cross four on the AP to doing two cross two to two simultaneously, two crimes simultaneously. So that's multi-user memo. There's efficiency there. OFDM is also another method where you're saying, okay, this AP can do 80 megahertz channel bandwidth, but my client can only support 40 megahertz. So I'm wasting the remaining 40 megahertz. What if I can talk to two different clients simultaneously? I'll use the entire 80 megahertz bandwidth here. 40 megahertz I'll give to one client. 
another 40 megahertz will give to other clients simultaneously. So that is an, again improving of efficiency. So techniques like this have been introduced to improve throughput. And similarly, techniques like MLO have been introduced in Wi-Fi 7. We'll talk about that uh, at a later time. To actually increase your efficiency, not just rely on throughput, but also improve efficiency. Uh, and, and those are two different two different factors, basically. So now let us look at, uh, we have about like uh, seven or eight minutes left. So let us look at uh, uh, like a re, uh, an example of a real world, uh, real world example. So now in our setup here, we have a small setup here. A number of you have asked for uh, some kind of practical examples, not just go up to theoretical. So we're going to show you some a little bit of a practical example here. So we have this uh, um, ASUS router, which is our latest and greatest Wi-Fi 7 router. Uh, that will uh, basically, uh, or actually Wi-Fi 6 router, I'm sorry, uh, that supports all the way up to, uh, on their uh, on their page, they said you can go up to all the way up to 11 gigabits per second. If you see all these combinations, uh, it can do. Even in the 11AX mode, it can go all the way up to 4 uh, gigabits per second, uh, 5 data rates. Right? So we put this particular uh, router to test to see what numbers we actually get. So to test this router, we said, okay, we're going to use four types of clients. Uh, one is 11AX client, uh, uh, which is 2 cross 2 MIMO 80 megahertz, and it is doing 1024 QAM modulation rate. And so with this combination, theoretically, you can support only up to 1 to 1, 1.2 gigabits per second rate. Now, already when this client is talking to this AP, this 11 MVP gigabits per second is not useful. It's only 1.2 gigabits per second you can do, right, in five data rates. If you're using a 11AX client. If you're using 11AC client, which is doing 2 cross 2 MIMO 80 megahertz, but it's a lower modulation rate, uh, 256 core modulation rate, theoretically, this client can only do a maximum of 866 Mbps, right, which is less than the 1.2 gigabits per second. Right? So already this is letter. The same AP, if it's talking to a different client, you can expect lesser theoretical rate. Now let's say this AP talks to a legacy client, 11N client. This one is only doing 40 megahertz channel bandwidth, even lower modulation rate. And uh, this one can do only up to 300 Mbps, right? This is theoretical phi rate, right? And let's say we go even more legacy. We use 11 BG uh, clients. This one is only doing one cross one MIMO, only 20 megahertz, only 64 core modulation. This can do a theoretical rate of only 54 Mbps. So we put these four clients to test individually across the same AP, and the throughput will vary a lot uh, because of what the capabilities of the client are irrespective of what the AP is capable of, right? So in other words, you get the fastest AP in the world and you spend all that money and you put that AP in your house. But if your client devices are legacy clients, or if you have at least one client device that is a legacy client, then you can expect overall very low performance. And you will not be able to use the full power of the, the Wi-Fi router that you purchased. So now what we did is we used uh, uh, one of our boxes to actually create these different types of clients. And, and run run uh, run a test. So let me just quickly show you that. Uh, we just VNC into this box. And so what we see here is we created four uh, Wi-Fi clients. The first one is a, a 11AX client, which does two by two MIMO 80 megahertz channel bandwidth. The second one is 11AC client, which does again two, two cross two MIMO 80 megahertz channel bandwidth. And then we did 11N client, 40 megahertz, and then 11BG client, 80 megahertz. All four clients are connected to the the, the ASUS router. And uh, now there is on the Ethernet side behind the uh, router, we connected to one of the Ethernet ports, which is capable of doing 2.5 gigabits per second. So if this AP, uh, this router supports two and a half gig Ethernet on the Ethernet side. So now what we'll do is we'll connect these clients to the router and we run traffic between the wired interface and the wireless interface. And we try to make uh, the throughput measurement. So for that, I'm using this, uh, this tool to actually generate around the test. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select first the uh, the 11 AX client here. So I'm going to select this client, and then I'm going to go run run start a test. So when I start a test, you will see that uh, this client is now using the uh, the higher modulation rates and higher phi rates. So you see that as I mentioned, this client can do up to 1.2 gigabits per second phi data rate uh, because it's 11 AX and this is the measured throughput. So of the 1.2 five data rate, it's always all, all, all approximately able to get about one gigabit per second throughput, 
right? This is what this client is able to successfully do. So 1.2, you can see here, it's actually doing 1.2 gigabits per second fire rate, but the throughput number is around close to one gig. This is what you can expect from the 11 AC client. And remember, this is under ideal conditions. The client device is very close to the AP. There is no interfer interference. Both of them are put, put inside an RF enclosure so that you're not getting any interference from anywhere. And this is the most ideal possible conditions. Now, if you run a rate versus range test where you move this device away, then this number will start dropping consistently. Or you had interference, then this number will drop, will start dropping. But this is the maximum you can get. And this AP is doing very well because it is close to the, the theoretical limit. Now, what we can do is we'll stop this test and uh, we are going to go back and instead of selecting AX, we are going to select the AC client. So, and uh, and then start running a test. Um, this time we're running an AC client. So if you go back to my slides here, we said the AC client is doing two cross two MIMO 80 megahertz, 256 form modulation. So it's theoretical rate is only about, uh, fire rate is only about 866 Mbps. So if you go back here, you can see that, you can see that here in this, it shows that for, for this particular client, it shows that it's 866 Mbps is the fire rate. And then if you go and look at the throughput number, you are getting about 700 something as your throughput number. So again, this AP is doing really well. The client is doing really well. Uh, the difference between the 866 and the 700 is uh, the basically the Mac and file layer overhead that I was talking about. So it is getting close to, close to theoretical performance. And so already you can see, even though this AP is capable of 1.8 gigabits per second fire rate, with this client, you're only seeing about 700. Now I'll stop this. And then I'm going to run, uh, uh, I'm going to remove the, and I'm going to add the 11N client, right? So this 11N client is again um, capable of only two cross to MIMO. If you go back to the slide, uh, let me start the test. So we're doing two cross to MIMO, uh, 40 megahertz channel bandwidth, 64 qualm. So the theoretical rate is only about 300 Mbps, right? Fire rate. So now let us see what it's doing in the, uh, in the test uh, it's only about doing about 200 something right so now it's not hitting the full theoretical rate because the overhead should not be 100 mbps the overhead should be lesser than that if the fire rate is 300 what it's achieving is 200 so there is something some problem here right it's not getting the full uh, full throughput right but you can see that the throughput has dropped again from uh, to about 200 mbps now if you run the test with uh, uh, remove this and then now you're going to the lowest one, which is BG, which where uh, the theoretical throughput is, uh, uh, the theoretical fire rate is about 54 Mbps. So now if I go and run that, again, it's the same AP. The only thing I'm doing is I'm changing the, the standard of the client, what protocol it uses. And then you'll see this drastic difference in throughput numbers. Now you can see it's only doing about 27 or so Mbps. So we, because the theoretical fire rate is 54, the achieved throughput is about 60% of that, which is around uh, 27, 28. It should really be a little bit more. It should be about 30 or so, but uh, there is some seems to be some inefficiencies with this access point. So you can see that uh, uh, that's the that, that, that's the throughput number. So by varying these things, you can actually see interesting data about how to run this throughput test and make these uh, the, these measurements. To summarize, uh, I wanted to show more things, but we are running out of time. So just to summarize, we talked about the MCS table. We talked about the different fire rates, uh, modulation rates, coding rates, and how the different standards use different fire rates. We talked about the idea of fire data rate and how it relates to throughput and how it boils down to throughput and all these details we discussed. Um, and uh, here are some references uh, that we can, uh, you can certainly go, go, go for. And um, we'll just uh, jump into QA if there are any questions. Thank you so much.